Greetings to all of my erudite magical friends out there on YouTube. My name is Jeff Kowalk and you are watching Erudite Magic. I really hope you enjoyed last week's view of Jim Kleefeld's 9,000 book library. In this week's episode, we're going to be delving into one of the greatest magic books of all time. Yes, if you don't have this book on your shelf, stop what you're doing right now and go buy it. We're talking about a book from a working pro, a compilation, an entire lifetime of someone's creative output condensed into three books. I think we only have time to cover one of those books in this episode, but I want to get started with none other than Paul Harris's Art of Astonishment, book one. If you don't already know the name Paul Harris, let me give you a brief rundown. Paul Harris is a close-up entertainer who performed out in Las Vegas. He published his first book called The Magic of Paul Harris back in 1976 and published a number of these booklets throughout the 70s into the 80s, culminating with his final book, Secrets of the Astonishing Executive in 1991. Later in 1996, all of his previous works were brought together in between the pages of three hardbound books put out by A1 Magical Media and Murphy's. Basically, it's a best of series. And in this video, we are going to review this book while at the same time giving you what you've been asking for, which is a study guide for The Art of Astonishment, Volume 1. Let's do this. I'd like to thank Don's Magic and Books for sponsoring this episode and for continuously finding great books to share with all of you, my erudite magical friends. The quick 50,000 foot overview of these books, it's mostly close up magic, but there is some parlor, stand up, walk around, and intimate magic, sure to please a variety of tastes. Paul Harris himself is always funny, but he's capable of communicating deeper thoughts when he wants to and often does in this book. Case in point, his thought-provoking essay on astonishment as our natural state of mind. In this essay, he explores what it means to present effective magic and what it means to your participants to experience magic that is given to them by a magician. I'll try to post some links at the end of this video so that you can see clips of Paul Harris performing and kind of get a glimpse into his style of performance, which is humorous, tongue-in-cheek, and often filled with innuendo. The book carries his voice across perfectly, and frankly, it's like being with Paul Harris to have him teach you these. He's throwing little jokes in there, and it's written in an extremely conversational and easy-to-read style. When you read through these effects, the first words that come to mind are quirky, offbeat, slightly unusual. But what that effectively means is that you're going to be getting magic that you're not going to find in other places. For example, who else would think about drawing sunglasses on a dollar bill or using a lip balm container as an Okito box? What about performing a light and heavy chest routine a la Robert Houdin with a dime and a penny? He's got everything from false cuts using the three card Monty throw to chop cups that are beanie weenie cans. He'll teach you how to rip an apple in half and then restore it. And he'll introduce us to his pal, Gregory Wilson. This first book in the trilogy is a little over 300 pages. Each of the books in the trilogy are following the chronological order of his books. Each of the effects are typically presented with the effect so that you know what's going to happen in this particular trick and then he will walk you through step by step what you need to do. None of this is very hard to do, which is why I believe Paul Harris made quite a name for himself among magicians in the 70s and 80s. Any of the slights that you need to know, he pretty much teaches you right there in the book. I'm going to break this review and guide down into sections so that you can jump to the parts that are applicable and interesting to you. First up are cards. Paul Harris is primarily a card guy, so even though it has all kinds of magic for all kinds of magicians, I think that well over half of the book is card magic. But there are some really cool card tricks, and I want to point you at them and give a brief description to either whet your appetite or get you to dig into the books and study what might work in your hands and for your audiences. Griffin Under Glass is a really cool card through glass routine, which originally was developed 
for a magic shop and the glass display case. However, I could see this working really well if you have a glass coffee table in your house. The neat part about this effect is that when the card penetrates the glass, you can actually see it drop through the glass into your waiting hand below the table. While most of the tricks in the book use the full deck, there are a couple of really cool tricks that use just a few cards. For example, the bizarre twist and the cross twist, which is Paul Harris's take on a small packet trick using three cards, two aces, and a participant's card, where the participant's card is placed between the two aces and turns itself face up. The effect is repeated, but this time, the card changes back color and all three cards are shown. Paul Harris has several versions of triumph routines, including one called Unshuffling Rebecca, where the plot and the premise of it really compelled me to examine it. The idea is that the deck is without defects. After a little bit of humorous byplay about how the deck has a defect, the cards are shuffled face up into face down in the standard triumph manner only to write themselves with a really great presentation. It's one of the few triumph routines I've seen that to me makes sense. If you're not interested in that presentation, you may be interested in Color Stunner, which is his triumph with a color changing deck as a kicker. There are a couple of really offbeat things with making a deck appear and vanish, not necessarily in the same effect, but for the appearing deck, you have the dehydrated deck where the performer takes out a folded up card case that has been dismantled, whips it open and blows into it to expand it. When he hands it to the participant, the entire deck of cards is in the case and they can remove the cards and the performer can begin performing close up magic with cards. The PH vanishing deck is a fun way to make an entire deck of cards vanish, whether in your hands on the table or on the box of cards themselves. You'll need a gimmick for this one, but he teaches you how to make it. And the neat part about it is while you may have difficulty making the gimmick for a standard deck of bicycle cards today, if you're wanting to perform a vanishing deck routine like this with a custom deck, it's easier than ever because he's going to teach you how to make your own gimmick. This is a great lead in for any type of card trick you want to do because you could take the deck out, make it vanish, and have it reappear back in the case, take the cards out and start performing again. There isn't a much more magical way to begin a set. As you can see with some of these triumph routines and others, Paul Harris has a really interesting way of turning a classic effect in magic on its head. And he doesn't stop with just triumph routines. He also takes on the ambitious card routine with his presentation of it called Solid Deception. Solid Deception allows the performer to perform an ambitious card routine with the climax of the routine like an Omni deck meaning that the entire deck of cards is found that it's glued together as an entire block and can't be separated, even though the performer was just seen inserting cards into the middle and having that card rise to the top. It's guaranteed to not only be a ton of fun, but also a real kick in the head to your audiences. Reset is one of the very first packet tricks I ever learned, and I learned it right here from this book. It is a transposition effect with two packets of cards, jacks, and aces that change places in the performer's hands with little to no interaction between the two packets. It's a really amazing effect and many people have come up with their own versions of this Paul Harris classic. I know you'll enjoy it if you check it out. Gambler versus Mentalist versus Magician is another triumph style presentation which also makes more sense than the traditional triumph routine, but it has the added kicker that you get to read the mind of the participant and tell them the card they're merely thinking of, all the while keeping them entertained with a humorous presentation. If you thought that this was all cards, you'd be wrong. There's quite the smorgasbord of magic tricks that use something other than a pack of playing cards, including Gregory Wilson's fabulous recap. In this routine, the performer takes a Bic pen and does quite a bit of by play with the cap coming off, vanishing, reappearing on the other end. The pen disappears and reappears, eventually vanishing altogether. The entire routine is impromptu. If you have a Bic pen, you can perform this routine. And so if you learn it, you're prepared to entertain for several minutes anywhere, anytime, 
with nothing more than a pen. Buck Naked is Paul Harris's take on a $1 and $5 transposition, which means that the performer either uses his own money or the participant's money, but in the effect, a one and a five exchange places within or under the participant's hand. And as you can imagine with the Paul Harris effect, it doesn't involve folding the dollar bill into eighths. He keeps them more open than that, but the method is pretty ingenious. Improv Nightshades is his version of a bill animation. The performer draws a pair of sunglasses with a Sharpie on George Washington's face from the $1 bill. He then moves his finger over George Washington's head and pulls the sunglasses back up on George's forehead. Of course, the borrowed bill can be returned to the participant as an eternal memory of an unforgettable piece of magic. He has several pieces with coins. One of the more interesting ones to me was his giant killer coins, which Paul Harris uses as an encore routine when he's asked to do it again after performing Al Schneider's Matrix. It's very similar to the Matrix routine with coins jumping around between cards and being produced under cards. At the end, however, the performer produces a giant coin underneath the cards, which comes as a complete surprise to your audience. I told you that everything that Paul Harris does is quirky and offbeat, and so who else would think of doing a torn and restored quarter? Yes, the quarter can be borrowed if you're dexterous enough, but you will tear a quarter in half and then visibly restore it before handing it out for examination. And again, from the fertile mind of Gregory Wilson and in the section that he contributed, you'll find Vanish 5000, which is a nice piece of restaurant magic with nothing more than a sugar packet and your hand. You tear open a sugar packet, mentioning that there are exactly 5,000 grains of sugar in each packet of sugar. You empty them into your hand, pretend to count them, and show that the sugar has completely vanished. And for those in the know, you're able to display everything very openly, if you know what I mean. So you have close up with cards, you have close up with other objects, but you also have some parlor pieces, which include his Las Vegas Leaper, which is a really easy to do cards across routine and has some excellent thinking in the follow up Leap of Faith by Bill Malone. It's basically a slight free way to present the cards across plot, so you don't wanna miss this if you're looking for something to entertain in your family room and parlor situations. Earth Shoes is a quickie, but it is a production of a rock from your shoe, which came completely out of nowhere. And once again, contributed from the fertile mind of Gregory Wilson, you have License to Thrill, which is a card to wallet routine, but with a really funny presentation about your participants drinking too much and you needing to see their driver's license. It can play really well for the cocktail lounge crowd or if you're at a party where people are having a few drinks. Ultimately, the participant's driver's license changes places with your driver's license and then their license appears in your wallet. In the end, everything is returned and the whole thing is basically impromptu if you have a small setup that you carry with you. Finally, I want to draw your attention briefly to some mentalism. There are a couple versions of Think of a Card, including the self-named Think of a Card, and the subsequent piece Deep Thought by Ray Cosby. In each, he shares his idea for how to ask a participant to look at a card and merely think of it. That's true. They don't tell you what it is. You upjog a card, and once you've committed to the card, the participant commits to their card by telling you what it is, and you show them the card you had upjogged was the one they were merely thinking of. That one's going to require a little bit of practice, but in the right hands, it's an impromptu reputation maker from a shuffled deck in use. Gregory Wilson also contributed another mentalism piece called 411. Your audience chooses an object in the room to think about collectively. You phone a number in the phone book, and the person on the other end, when you ask them to name any object in the world, they name the one object that your audience has chosen. It will need a little bit of updating for today's technology, but with some simple thinking, the entire thing can still work very well. You may not think of it as a mentalism effect, but there is a beautiful piece of magic called creation. The performer tears up a bit of napkin and tells a story about a moth or a butterfly and how it goes from a caterpillar to a moth. When the performer opens the bits of paper, a real live moth flies out from the napkin. 
I know it's not strictly mentalism, but I don't think of this as being a production because the props are so organic and the story, the way that you do it, I really feel like it's such a strong piece of almost creating something with your mind. Be sure to check it out, and if you have the opportunity to perform it, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Invisible Rising Card is probably somewhat similar to the Think of a Card routines, but it is a way to perform the invisible deck with nothing more than a regular deck, and you don't have to have the deck memorized. Those are a few of the tricks that I thought were really great, but let me hear from you below what is your favorite Paul Harris trick from Art of Astonishment book one. I think that this book is absolute gold, and I can't believe that it has been in continuous print and publication since 1996. I think it's a testament to how well Paul Harris's material has stood the test of time that it is still available. And in fact, you can get the entire three volume set over at Don's, I think right now for $100. Now, of course, if you apply this week's code AOA1, then you can save 10% and get free shipping. So that is a killer deal for a ton of magic. The books are normally $45 each, which even at that price to me is an incredible steal for the volume and quality of material that you're getting in these. I recommend that if you're thinking about getting them, you pull the trigger sooner rather than later because after 25 years of continuously being in print, I don't know how long that will continue. You guys know I absolutely love compilations of someone's previous works because you're getting all the best of, the updates, the additional thinking, how these things have changed over the years, and this is certainly no exception. I find myself going back to these books again and again and again, if not for the humor, for the awesome magic. I know offhand several magicians who have made an entire living performing close-up and strolling magic using nothing more than the tricks that are published in these books. If you enjoyed this style of review, which is more of a book guide in addition to the review, let me hear from you down below because I will think about doing more of these in the future if it's something you like. If it's not, I also want to hear from you down below about what I can do to make your viewing experience better. As always, I appreciate you being erudite magicians for watching, liking, subscribing, telling your friends about the channel, and interacting so I know what it is you want to hear about in your magical journey. Until next time, all my erudite friends, keep reading.